Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And our last episode, we brought you observation, what, I, what would you say, spherical observation balloons all the way through Zeppelins. This point, we would thought we would continue on with uh, reconnaissance biplanes. We have some interesting exhibits uh, at the museum and also some airframes that just don't exist. You can find them occasionally in some of the national museums, but they are extremely difficult to find. Today we're going to talk about the Albatross, the C1 through the C3 series. Now Greg has outdone himself. I'm talking about German airplane. He has given me my Fräulein look today. Is that it? My Fräulein look. Trust me, as we get further into this, you're going to see that Greg has gone all in on this episode. He is my crepuscular assistant, my crepuscular assistant. So I'm going to go ahead and lose my Fräulein headgear, and I'm going to toss it to him off camera. Excellent catch, Mr. Kenny. And so we're talking today about, I mean, these airplanes have gone by the wayside. They're gone, and for reasons primarily that they're made out of wood and fabric, and they were quite fragile. You know, we talked about the Wright brothers, and, you know, just 10 years later, we're starting to see now airplanes uh, pick up speed. They're going higher, and they really are becoming refined into killing machines, into uh, World War One into the 19. They started really becoming deadly weapons from about 1913 forward. The advancement in armament and maneuverability in the World War One airplanes was really aggressive. And the most aggressive folks that were working on that at that time were the Germans. So we're going to talk about this Albatross. Now the Albatross was the first successful two-seat biplane. It was a reconnaissance airplane, and it flipped the script. You know, we talked about the steerman, where the steerman pilot, you know, uh, is in the back seat and the observer or the student is in the front seat. This flipped the script to where when Greg takes a image of this, you'll see that the observer is in the back seat with a 7.92 uh, millimeter machine gun, basically doing his little observation work and he has a rear firing gun. That's a feature that would go all the way through to World War II. As fighters became more sophisticated, a rear firing gunner or gunners in firing positions on these airplanes become, became less and less uh, relevant because the armament became so deadly that they just couldn't reach out and defend the airplane anymore. But back in the day, these rear firing machine guns were quite deadly and what they were up against now this is an Albatross D-Series fighter. Greg will get a really good shot of this C-Series reconnaissance aircraft, but a lot of the uh, functions on these biplanes, these early biplanes, didn't really change much. All fabric, all fabric, uh, in the case of the fighters, a forward firing machine gun either fitted on the front here with interrupter gear, it fired through the propeller. In the early days, the propeller was armored, where they didn't care whether a bullet hit it or not, which is kind of interesting, Greg. You're up there flying around and you got bullets bouncing off the propeller. In the later versions, they had interrupter gear. So when the propeller was out of the way, the, the gun would fire. But if the propeller was in the way, it would have a cam in there that would keep the, the uh, machine gun from firing through the propeller. In these uh, reconnaissance aircraft, no matter what they were, they had that rear firing machine gun typically on a ring to where the machine gunner could move it around in a field of fire. In the early ones, they even had to be careful about shooting off their tail. In the very early days, Greg, they were actually up there shooting each other with revolvers and, and long rifles, uh, the, but they didn't have machine guns. But the aircraft had uh, no armor didn't have self-sealing fuel tanks, was primarily made out of wood. Now in these reconnaissance aircraft, this plane, if you can believe it or not, this Albatross, the C-Series, actually had, it could get up to an altitude of about 10,000 feet, 9,800 feet, and it had a speed anywhere from about 70 miles an hour up to about 85 mile an hour. 
Now these were in line, they were either a Mercedes, now pay attention here on this one, they either were a Mercedes or they were a Benz engine, depending on the type. Mercedes and Benz hadn't married up yet. You can actually see the cylinders across the top. They were rudimentary, but think about, we've gone from, you know, 10, 13, 14 years from bicycle chains, and we talked about that aluminum engine with the Wright brothers, to these fairly robust engines that put out 150, 160 horsepower, uh, and they were, they were quite powerful for the day. Now this particular, the C-Series, was prevalent from about 1915 to 1917, uh, and it was, it was phased out after that. It fell out of favor at that point. Now it was produced, and I'm gonna mess this one up, Greg. Albatross Flugewerk. Flugewerk, Flugewerks. And I, my German friends, I apologize. Uh, and it, that, that company started in 1909. Now think about this in relation to the Wright brothers, okay? Not that far after, 1909, they were building these military aircraft uh, less than 10 years later. Now, the interesting thing about that company is it merged with one well-known company, Greg, in 1931. That would be Focke-Wulf. So they merged up into Focke-Wulf. Of course, Focke-Wulf would build with Kurt Tank, some, probably the best fighter of the war in the FW-190, and you can argue with me in the comments on that, but a very, very, and a number of other great airplanes. And Kurt Tank would go on to have a really interesting career uh, down in Argentina where his career kind of petered out. But this airplane for its day was state of the art. It doesn't look like it now, but at that time it was. As I said, there are ex very, very few of these uh, aircraft still in existence or in museums. Greg can throw up some of them in post. Even fewer are flying because they are, um, they're just so fragile. They just didn't survive. And there wasn't this is an interesting situation in that the, there was not a lot of preservation going on. With these aircraft, uh, we talked about Zeppelin and Zeppelin having to turn over all of its works uh, in the Treaty of Versailles. These aircraft manufacturers were no different and what ended up happening was these types were either absorbed into Allied Air Forces and guess what, there's no supply, there, there's no parts train for these. So they probably flew them until the wings fell off of them or until they were damaged or whatever. And, uh, and they just kind of went into history and museums weren't keeping these. Now I will give a shout out to a museum that we have no affiliation with, but probably the best World War I collection I have ever seen is the British War Museum. The British had a, had a really good bead on history and they would keep aircraft, some of the, especially adversary aircraft. Some of the aircraft that they have uh, in their inventory today is, it's the only place in the world you'll find them. But nobody was thinking about this back when the war was over and they retired these airplanes or they just flew them into oblivion. Now, what I wanna do today is I'm going to talk about one guy who not really well known but another guy who's extremely well known that are associated with this type. But first I wanna do my salute. And my salute today, as I said, Greg has gone all in with this, all in. Not only was I a beautiful, beautiful Freulein, Greg, would you say that, a beautiful Freulein? But today he has provided me with Zuberfizz. Zuberfizz. Um, I say that, I try to say that with a straight face. It's a key lime soda. Let's see, 159 calories. So you've actually reduced the calorie count, Greg. I, I appreciate that greatly. Uh, bottled in Durango, uh, Colorado, which is interesting for Zuberfizz. Zuberfizz has no sell by date. It does have a California redemption value though. So if you happen to poison me, you can actually redeem the bottle, which is kind of nice. Uh, and it's quality over quantity since 2002. So they haven't been arrested any time in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop this. The guys and, and girls and everyone involved with this early flight 
remember we talked about the Zeppelins being literally equivalent of space shuttle technology. All of this stuff, whether in the biplanes, whether it was in reconnaissance aircraft, or whether it was in these fighters, none of it had been tested. And so a lot of it was go out, fly it, break the airplane, don't die, and come back and tell somebody how it worked. And if that worked okay, just keep pushing the envelope. Battle planes replaced aeroplanes. And as Orville Wright said, the dream has turned into a nightmare. The military spoke of fleets of aerial dreadnoughts. But at the outset, the legacy of years of official neglect amounted to little more than a hundred ill-equipped machines for the Allies. While the first dogfights were fought with pistols and hand-thrown bombs, the official distrust remained. The cavalry complained that the machines frightened their horses. Yet to break the stagnation of trench warfare, much depended on those airplanes and on those pilots. The pictures that survive show groups of tender-looking youngsters, British, French, German, equally brave, equally vulnerable. Most of them to die in their early twenties. In a world short of heroes, the public rose to these daring aces. Especially in the war period, in World War I, both sides were basically fighting for advantage of the sky and trying to take advantage of the sky. And so technology moves very, very quite fast. And you know, your life expectancy, if you were a fighter pilot, whether you're a British fighter pilot or a German fighter pilot was measured in days and weeks once you got to the front. The chances of you surviving were extremely low. And as the war went on, especially as the Allies achieved air superiority, the Germans, uh, the life expectancy of the German pilots became uh, smaller and smaller. So to all of those early pioneers in these biplanes, I salute you with my Zuber Fizz. Give it a shot here, Greg. Greg, that's not awful. It is not awful. I'm going to give it one more shot. Compared to that, whatever that was you gave me in the last episode, this isn't bad. I would give Zuber Fizz a pass. It's a little flat, but it's not terrible. So we're going to put Zuber Fizz down. Now, I told you there with this Albatross, with this C1 through 3 series, there are two uh, very important. Oswald, and I'm again, I'm going to have fun with this name, either Bolke or Blocky and von Richthofen, both uh, uh, Bolka, Oswald Bolka, actually, and I, if my German friends, if I butchered that, I apologize. He had his first aerial kill in one of these. He went on, he was extremely, extremely important in coming up with early maneuvers in air combat. And of course, von Richthofen, which was the uh, Red Baron, which one of the reasons why we picked this aircraft, uh, was uh, pivotal uh, in the air war and legendary. So both of those uh, gentlemen actually cut their teeth in this airplane, if you can believe that. Now the airplane by the end of the war was completely obsolete. And what ended up happening was they were so obsolete that they were essentially death traps. If you went up in them, you were gonna get shot down. And observation, like we talked about with observation balloons, observation in these airplanes was a was a very, very dangerous business. Both sides wanted to do it, but the fighter sweeps, and as we got more and more into a formalized fighting style for both air forces, in other words, fighter sweeps, defensive maneuvers, uh, anything that had to do with observation became dangerous because neither side wanted the other side to know what they were doing. So if they saw observation or observation aircraft or blimps or zeppelins or airplanes, they went after them every opportunity they got. Now, uh, this one here, this is an exhibit that you can see at the museum. I encourage you to do that. This is a full-scale replica of the airplane. It is actually made out of fabric and wood, and, and, uh, and it is very, very cool. It is one of the most detailed replicas of a World War I airplane that I have ever seen. So I encourage you to come down and do that. Now, 
if you want to amaze your friends, we told you last week about the opportunity to have a framed balloon Zeppelin puzzle. This one is again, this starts out with all of the early war or just pre-war uh, aircraft, German, British, all over in there. And you can build this, this model is suitable for framing. If you click on the link, you can uh, pick one of these up. Jason will be happy to send it to you. We cannot do this work and preserve these exhibits uh, without your donation. So hit that donation page. We appreciate it if you do that. That's a way that we keep functioning. If you have seen us on YouTube today, hopefully we earned your subscription and subscribe to the channel. We, we really like it when you do that. Leave us some feedback uh, down below and, and tell us. We, we get some interesting comments and we, we encourage those. So like us on uh, YouTube, subscribe. If you're on Facebook, uh, like us on Facebook. And remember to catch another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. We'll see you again.